Good morning, everyone. Today is a great day. I will, uh, I will uh, hope you uh, happy Ramadan for you, for your family, for Ozib ecosystem. Um, as usual, we will have a great debate with a special guest with us uh, today. Uh, let me introduce um, our uh, special guest for you. Um, Shang Salt is an AI pioneer with the uh, 80 US patent uh, on AI and several AI research articles. He's deployed AI solution in a variety of fields, including education, forecasting, predictive maintenance, and AI assistance. Shang is also cheese enthusiast. We'll discuss about this. Uh, this um, Aria, uh, who has deployed, developed the cheese uh, engine based on ChatGPT3 and uh, ChatGPT on GPT3 IA models. Uh, he's also head of artificial intelligence in at Gems in Dubai, um, where he uh, oversees a number of IA programs focused on enthusiasm, mean learning and teaching uh, outcomes. He has received a number of prestigious IA awards from various organizations. Samid said, welcome to Morocco, welcome to Casablanca, welcome to OZIM and welcome to OZI Talks. Yeah, thank you. So. Um, my first question is um, about your, uh, the purpose of your journey in Casablanca. Mm -hmm. What is the, the purpose of uh, your journey now in Casablanca? Sure. So I'm here to attend the, the Casablanca just week. I was invited by uh, the Casablanca Stock Exchange to come over here and have a discussion on the chess and AI. So I uh, work mainly on AI solutions. I've been uh, involved in developing AI solutions using ChatGPT and GPT models for more than a year now. I've uh, been working on artificial intelligence for close to 10 years. So I have done some work on integrating uh, AI models and building chess engines using that. So that's uh, given that background, I was invited for the Casablanca Chess event. I'm really honored to be here uh, to be part of the, the event with much esteemed guests. Okay, so welcome another time. And uh, we thank uh, uh, Si Mohammed Saad because he's, he make the connection between you and Ozim. And, yeah. uh, uh, so my first question, you know, uh, Ozim Talks is um, uh, special talks and debates beyond the digital. And, uh, we focused uh, one year ago on finance, on education, on uh, healthy, and now we want to focus on AI technology. What is uh, the, the, the this huge uh, subject of uh, AI technology? My first question is: You, as uh, an expert on AI and on ChatGPT, how does ChatGPT work? Because mm -hmm. we want to know how it works. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I can understand like uh, for, a, for a person who is not actually into AI, using these technologies can you know, look very overwhelming, like you know, it can do a lot of things. So uh, maybe I'll try to explain it in simple terms how it works internally. So uh, chat GPT or any uh, large language models that you have today, so they are trained on a lot of text data that we can get from uh, internet. So. Uh, these com big companies like OpenAI and Google, they have collected all data that they can get from Wikipedia, um, books, and all the other different websites. So I have collected a huge amount of textual data. And they have fed this data to uh, big neural networks, which are machine learning models. Okay. So it is kind of like you can think of like it's compressing all the knowledge out there into a big uh, neural network, into a big brain. It is trying to compress all that mm -hmm. into that. And it tries to learn patterns in this text and with that what it can do is that any question that you ask it's very likely that you would have seen something very similar in its data that it was collected and it's able to regenerate that using uh, whatever you say so if you are asking uh, the chat gpt to uh, write a social media post about casablanca mm. just week so what it would have seen is that you would have seen a lot of text about similar events and people yes. posting that and it's able to create that so in that way it is what how it is doing is it's trying to memorize a lot of the things that it has seen and is trying to recreate using the patterns that it, it has already seen. You talked about uh, also uh, the, the data. And my second question is about uh, what training data was used to train ChatGPT because mm. uh, we have uh, data since uh, uh, mm. until uh, 2021. 2021 yeah. So um, how was uh, uh, how was that data collected mm. and 
pre-processed to be mm. uh, used in on chat gpt yeah so uh, like i said uh, wikipedia is one of the major sources of data and there are other data opens open data sets like you know they crawl all over the net and they collect all the data that they can get from different websites so it can run into uh, GBs or even terabytes of data. So they collect all the textual data mm. and then the, it's a text, uh, they extract only the text from this data and that is what is fed to the model. The model is trained in such a way um, uh, like w what it does is that uh, it, uh, it gives a part of the text to the model and asks it to predict the next word or the next set of words from that. So based, basically, if you repeat this process over a huge amount of data and the model is really big, it is able to learn patterns from that and that's how it is able to create or recreate or generate new text uh, from the data. We will not focus on uh, only ChatGPT because mm. uh, I have two other questions on ChatGPT. Uh, we will discuss also about uh, AI technology, ah. uh, what is the impact of AI on uh, civil sector, on private sector, and mm. public sector and many organizations will be impacted by, uh, by uh, AI. Mm. My um, third question about ChatGPT, mm. um, uh, it's about um, uh, how uh, is it possible for ChatGPT, for example, to to learn new things over time? And mm. uh, if so, how is that accomplished? Okay, so um, that's a very interesting question. Like uh, when you when you are talking about learning new things, right? So there are two ways we can see that. So like you said earlier, the data that it is already trained on that's only till September twenty twenty one. So one thing, one way that it will be updated in the future is that they might get more recent data and retrain the model with that. Um, but another way in which the model is being refined is through what we call as reinforcement learning. That is mainly from the feedback uh, what we are giving. So if, if it is giving us an answer and we give a feedback that this answer is better or this answer is worse than the earlier answer. So that actually goes into the model to refine the answers that it's yeah, generating. Yeah. So next time when you ask a question, all the feedback will be taken into account and you might get a better answer. Uh, yeah, this question and uh, maybe there is another question about ethic. Mm. Uh, facing AI, we will discuss uh, mm. uh, later. Uh, last question about ChatGPT, uh, focus on uh, different language, different dialects. Mm. How accurate its uh, translation capability? Uh, mm. Because when you uh, ask in English, uh, there is an uh, answer in English. If you uh, mm. uh, ask uh, in any dialect or language, you will have uh, answer. How can we uh, see a relevant Mm. answer about this yeah sure so um, what uh, the open AI has also uh, released is something called error rate so mm. for different languages they have different error rates definitely english is the one with the most accuracy and uh, they have a, given a list of uh, different languages and what is the error rate for each one of those so using that we can refer and identify like if you are specifically targeting let's say arabic and uh, if you are using English and Arabic together, what kind of accuracy you can expect? So I don't remember the numbers at the top of my mind, but it's already released and a publicly available data. So anybody can refer and identify how accurate it is for different languages. Okay. Uh, I um, asked you about ChatGPT and I want to develop also about AI. Mm. Uh, maybe see six months ago, mm. uh, Ozim prepared Les Assises. It's a big event, mm. 2022, with the uh, all ecosystem. And we discuss about uh, humanity and technology. We mm. also discuss about the future of, uh, of work. Um, and we see now there is a great acceleration, mm. huge acceleration about uh, AI. What is the impact mm. of this uh, accelerating about uh, AI, mm. uh, facing different sector in mm. industry, in education, in health, for mm. example, for you. Yeah. So uh, definitely, like I really agree with you, the, the impact that it has have night, right now, it's really exponentially it has grown, like especially with the release of ChatGPT. Almost everyone working in any domain are aware of that and actually using it in their daily lives. You know, uh, they, can, they can automate or reduce the task, that uh, amount of time they are spending on tasks, definitely using ChatGPT. So it has uh, wider implications across uh, sectors. So uh, maybe if you just take the example of education. So 
it is a two-edged sword in when it comes to education. Mm -hmm. There are concerns like you know whether students are just using ChatGPT to generate answers and submit the assignments. How how do we counter that? Um, but there is the other side of um, uh, using AI in education where we can do a, a lot of uh, uh, state of the art things like you know personalizing education for each student, automating a lot of tasks which uh, teachers are doing. Uh, with AI. So, for example, uh, right now uh, we have deployed a solution in GEMS where uh, the teachers can just upload uh, PDFs or uh, documents. GEMS is uh, only focused on education. Uh, GEMS is a network okay. of the biggest network of schools in the world and they are mainly be a focus uh, on you develop application around the AI hmm. uh, for, Focused for students? Yeah, for students, okay. yeah. Okay. So there, um, what we have developed is a solution where it can ingest any textbook and can automatically understand what is being taught in the books and can create quizzes of different types and the teacher can uh, also uh, uh, define like what is the difficulty level, what kind of questions they want and it automatically creates for them. So it really automates a lot of things which teachers are out to you know, actually spend time on other ways. And also the, uh, the best uh, features of this having AI in education is we can personalize a lot of uh, stuff which is going to the students based on their levels. The students will see different uh, content based on that. But, but there is some side who, who, uh, who think that there will be a negative impact for mm. students because mm. Uh, you know, for example, when you are in university and you ask a question about philosophy or anthropology or mm. uh, uh, mathematics, yeah. uh, the easy thing to do now is to yeah. go to Orchard GPT and to yeah. get uh, the mm. answer. So, uh, is it for you as an expert and as mm. pioneer on AI, focus on education, mm. the impact uh, for you, is it uh, uh, positive or negative for mm. uh, in education? So, um, uh, that's a very good question that you asked. Like. Um, uh, if you look at it that way, right, um, what needs to change is the way the evaluations are done in schools and universities. Uh, there is no point in, um, you know, some schools are actually banning chat GPT in schools and colleges, but uh, students are really smart. If you ban something, they will find some other way to do that. There mm -hmm. are uh, uh, solutions which can detect uh, some output or some text is coming from GPT or not. But there are other AI solutions which can rephrase the complete output that is coming from chat GPT and create different, uh, it uh, express the same thing in different words. Now there is no way we can detect these things. So uh, banning something or avoiding the, the technology is not going to be the solution. Mm -hmm. We have to embrace the new innovations that's coming in. You know, uh, when you see, for example, that there is uh, 300 million jobs mm. uh, going to disappear, uh, you know, in, in private sector in US, mm. uh, the impact is uh, very great uh, for some jobs. Yeah. And the question is uh, how to be prepared to the new uh, mm. normal or new reality yeah. with AI mm. for young people. Yeah. Uh, they want to develop their own business, for example, to mm. create a uh, uh, ECME or to to be a, a mm. manager in in, uh, uh, in some organization, yeah, public or mm. private. Yeah, definitely. So um, I, I don't believe it's uh, going to be an overnight shift that you know uh, that we can get rid of employees and start using ChatGPT as an employee from tomorrow onward. So that's that's not the the situation. Okay. Uh, even today that um, the output that it generates or from chat gpt or any other ai model right that needs a human oversight it's more like a human and ai working together and that's going to be the case at least you know uh, maybe uh, two three years from now it's going to be the same like you know it's uh, i don't think that ai can completely replace a human uh, in most of the jobs that you know what we are doing because there is a there is an element of creativity and intuition and thought process involved which is not actually you know re uh, reproducible in these AI models mm -hmm. so how we can actually equip ourselves is to actually use these technologies to make ourselves more productive mm -hmm. and uh, uh, actually it, it's a it's a real concern like we are not really sure the, the the exponential growth that uh, AI is having, right? Which all jobs will be completely replaced in the the near future or five years from now? Mm -hmm. But uh, what what we can do is equip ourselves to learn and unlearn fast, so that whatever comes uh, in the future, right, we are equipped for that. You know, uh, in Ozim, we, we are uh, we have this um, this word. It's uh, very interesting to learn, to unlearn, to relearn mm -hmm. and to be surprised 
uh, definitely. Uh, there's another question when we talk about jobs and uh, the impact of AI on this uh, sector, uh, even if uh, private sector or uh, public sector, the, the impact for education, for mm. skills, for young people. Um, three or four years ago, we talked to, to uh, young people to be a special developer, to develop uh, uh, skills on coding. Mm. Uh, now with AI, yeah. what is the new skills mm. to develop for young people? Yeah, uh, so definitely uh, that, that, that's, a, uh, that's a great area of concern. How do we equip our next generation for, because we are completely uncertain of how the future is going to be. So uh, a general guideline would be um, to have a broader perspective, to have broader skill sets and also uh, one specific aspect that I have seen uh, with AI is that AI is more likely to replace jobs which do not have uh, a human element in that. Mm. If you are uh, doing a job today with uh, you know sitting behind a laptop or on a computer far away from or without interacting with end customers directly, those kind of jobs are more most likely to be replaced by an AI. Jobs which have a human connect where uh, even though AI might be running in the background or we might be using AI, but we need a human touch for let's say for example a doctor. Mm. A patient would never want to take advice or get a diagnosis from a robot doctor or an yes. AI. Always that human element is there. For a, for a teacher, even though a teaching there can be a lot of things which AI can help, the ultimate delivery of lessons, the, the teaching and the learning experience that has a human element mm. to that. Compare that to uh, let's say coding where you don't, you don't you just use your mobile apps or web pages you don't really care like you know who is actually developing that so those kind of jobs where there is no human element and human touch they are most likely to be uh, you know, automated. Thank you Shem. Uh, I have an, another question uh, maybe uh, we can discuss about jobs in the private sector uh, you know, AI will impact also public sector, and you know, in Morocco we have uh, I mean administration, organization, ministry, and uh, uh, what is um, facing or your experience mm -hmm. around the world because you are pioneer and AI? Um, what is the important thing to do for our administration, for our ministry, mm -hmm. to be? Uh, for, for example, for this ministry or for this uh, administration uh, to accept, to adapt, to be prepared to uh, make some applications or some things with AI. Is it possible? Is it uh, difficult? To what, uh, what time to, to need to, to develop this, uh, mm. uh, this opportunity for administration for public sector? Yeah. So, um, there are some challenges when it comes to public sector mm. and using these kind of technologies. So, Right now, these kind of technologies are actually uh, being uh, owned by select few companies like OpenAI, Google, or Microsoft, and it's kind of becoming their monopoly. Now, if you have to develop a solution, we are essentially handing over our data to these uh, companies and trusting them with their, our own data. Now, the challenge is that if we have to build such a solution ourselves, mm. that's not really feasible because these okay. companies have invested millions and millions of dollars to build such huge models, even training uh, such huge models, getting the data for such huge models is not something uh, which we can do as a separate entity or a separate company. It will, we will not be able to do that. Okay. So that brings a challenge when it comes to public sector. How do we trust the, the public's data uh, with these companies and how do we just hand over our data and trust them to you know treat it uh, in a responsible manner. So. Uh, that, that's uh, I think there's there's some uh, policies that needs to uh, be taken into account some policies need to come uh, the governments need to sit together and identify what is the the best guidelines to go forward with if if, if it's not advisable for uh, a government to hand over data to these external companies mm -hmm. then how do we replicate something similar how do we replicate an experience for the end customers with something which we can maybe yes. build in-house so that needs investment that needs a lot of commitment from the the, the public uh, sector governments mm -hmm. and uh, you and uh, as a pioneer and as an expert um, if you can share with us some uh, uh, important experience for example or use case in uh, uh, healthy sector, in uh, agriculture sector, in mm. uh, uh, many different sector in industry, for example, mm. um, which 
uh, they work with AI and the impact is uh, very uh, interesting and very important. Yeah. Uh, for example, mm. definitely. So um, I think it's it's uh, really becoming a breakthrough in almost all the sectors that you mentioned. Uh, some of the, the the examples that I have seen in the health domain is actually uh, helping the doctors uh, uh, with with early warnings of uh, you know the seriousness or illnesses that the patients can develop. Yeah. So uh, one thing which, uh, which which may not be just large language models, there are other AI models which are tracking all the different parameters that are coming from the patients and de <coughs> uh, developing uh, kind of like early warning systems which can. Uh, track the patient and also you know alert the, the doctors about that and also um, uh, there are other solutions which summarize the latest research that is happening in different domains and deliver that uh, in an easy and uh, uh, digestible manner to uh, the, the doctors so that way that helps the, the doctors to be you know up to date with the latest yeah. research um, so uh, see also mm -hmm. in uh, mm -hmm. uh, Lawyer, for example, mm -hmm. they will be replaced by uh, AI, uh, doctor by AI, lawyer by AI, translator by AI. Uh, some m many uh, many person will be afraid about this um, transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, today or uh, two days before, um, there is uh, one uh, thousand experts. Uh, the rights paper yeah. to to tell to around the world that uh, we need to stop development of AI. Mm. Uh, what is your feeling about this? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so my opinion about this uh, uh, this is that I, I don't think innovation can be stopped. Mm. It's not really practical that you know you stop developing or innovating on uh, the AI models. Uh, Otherwise, there has to be like some serious red flags or some serious concerns that should have come up. Otherwise, I don't feel you know it's practical to stop these new uh, innovations. Mm -hmm. So, I think I, I can see understand some of the concerns which uh, the team uh, is actually coming up with. Uh, so, some of those concerns are genuine. Like you know, some of the experts who have signed that petition. Is uh, not because they are scared that you no know, the the GPT-4 is becoming sentient or the next model will become sentient and you know, machines are going to take over the world. It's more about uh, the checks and balances that put in place as of today. Mm. So in a rush to the market, this kind of technology and you know enhance the reach of these kind of solutions to the people, uh, it's. The, the, uh, there are not enough checks and balance to ensure that you know it's not being misused or uh, false information or wrong information is actually spread uh, to people using these tools. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there is a, a very uh, interest, interesting aspect of these models like large language models like you know, chat GPT. So they, they tend to hallucinate. Uh, so that, that's the term that uh, that's the technical term that's used, uh, and when wh what we call hallucination is that if, you know it can it can look at a, a piece of text and then it can it will create an output which will which will look very possible and very human like and uh, extremely factual, but it is extremely incorrect. Mm -hmm. And there is no way that you know the model can identify okay this this whatever it is creating is wrong. The model is just trained or it's just predicting the next set of words yes so in most of the aspects where you are you are using you know you will find it to be useful and you know it is giving you very good output but uh, it has this tendency to hallucinate but if, if a student is using that to learn new things and is asking questions and just believing the answers which is given by this kind of models right it's a very high chance that you know they might be learning uh, uh, wrong things mm -hmm. it it can also generate very biased outputs you know uh, kind of like uh, offensive uh, outputs in some contexts so uh, if we have to actually resolve these kind of things it's and really um, important that we put extra effort, extra time into uh, this kind of thing. So that's that's a concern some uh, pioneers who signed that uh, you know, petition had. Yeah. Uh, but some of the others were talking about the AI becoming sentient and machines taking over the world. So I, I, I don't. Because they, 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 they asked the, the the important thing is about ethics. Mm. Uh, mm. What is the mix between uh, mm. uh, business development on uh, AI yeah. and uh, ethics? And yeah, true. So th that's uh, that, that's uh, that's an interesting uh, aspect, and I believe that you know more work needs to be done. Yeah. Uh, but maybe uh, not stopping the the development. Maybe that's I not agree. the right yes. approach for that. Yes. 
uh, but definitely I feel that you know there should be some sort of regulation for these kind of uh, lang large language models how chat GPT is being used maybe it should be used only for specific use cases where you are sure that you know it will give uh, Shami, you know, when you uh, talk about uh, regulation it means that uh, the we need for example, in Morocco, we need that there is a, a partnership between uh, OSIM, for example, and mm. all ecosystem, mm. public sector, private sector, to work together to develop some uh, new rules mm. uh, to develop AI. Exactly. Yeah, yeah so it's no, not to uh, develop AI, but how the AI is being used. Yeah. Maybe uh, it needs to be limited uh, to uh, use cases where we know, you know it's nothing offensive or nothing um, wrong is coming out of the model. It, it gives you very extremely good output in specific use cases when you, when you use it as a, as a writing assistant where you want to, to generate different types of tests, different types of posts, papers, etc. It works really well. But you cannot just rely on that to give you factual data. If you are using that to learn new things and expecting that you know you will ask ans uh, questions to that and believe the answers and enhance your learning right then uh, th that's a risky path and so those kind of use cases have to be actually monitored it's it has to be either done by these big companies or when we adopt these kind of solutions we need to have yeah. those kind of checks and balances in place you know shamil as uh, uh, as usual in uh, aussie talks at the end mm -hmm. we ask our uh, special guest to address uh, the important message sure. to all our community. So it's uh, uh, the story, the, the stage in yours. Sure, yeah. So uh, my advice to all uh, would be that in a, this is an exciting time that we are going through for AI. Uh, there is an exponential growth of uh, adoption of AI in different fields. So what uh, we all can do is to you know um, engage ourselves more in these kind of technologies, educate ourselves with what can be done with these kind of technologies, where they fail, and use that as a very effective tool to make us more productive. There's no point in fearing uh, technology and you know uh, worrying about how the future would be. But I believe uh, the the true usage of AI is enhancing ourselves and equipping ourselves uh, for a better future. Thank you, uh, Shamil, for your generosity, for your uh, sharing experience, for your all information you share with us. Uh, les amis uh, de tout l'écosystème de l'OZIM, je tiens à vous remercier. Nous avons été en direct du QG de, euh, de l'OZIM, le 27. Et bien entendu, nous avons aujourd'hui une annonce à vous faire qui est très, très importante. Nous sommes au 30e anniversaire de l'OZIM. Regardez. Euh, juste derrière vous, 30 ans qui se sont passés, on a euh, fait beaucoup de chemin. Restez connectés, il y aura du nouveau pour l'annonce officielle de, du 30e anniversaire de l'OZIM. D'ici là, recevez beaucoup de bonheur. Ramadan Mubarak Saïd et à la prochaine.